What if I were to tell you that there's an entire hidden marketplace out there where human beings trade markers of status with one another for power, prestige, a sense of recognition, etc. This marketplace is where culture gets created, where new norms, new habits, new meanings are born. Now, what if I were to also tell you that most of you in this virtual room are unaware of such a marketplace, and because you're unaware, you are missing out on the ability to identify shifts in culture that are gonna impact existing and future lines of your business. Just rewind 10 years and you'll find that the markers of status, just 10 years ago, were quite simple, quite static, quite traditional. Education, wealth, some publicly recognized forms of accomplishments, that was basically all that mattered in the US. In Europe, you may add your family lineage to the equation, but that's pretty much it. These markers of status were quite traditional and static. But enter the internet, e-commerce, globalization, we suddenly find ourselves in an environment where there are now thousands of such markers of status. And we use the term symbolic capital to understand and explain it. It was a term originally coined by a French sociologist named Pierre Bourdieu Symbolic capital is critical because it helps us understand why we suddenly find ourselves in an environment where we are surrounded by thousands of these markers. You see, we are no longer just buying a BMW, a degree. We're no longer just buying a big house or access to that country club. We're also buying unique knowledge. We're also buying the ability to get to know ourselves, the ability to connect to nature. Symbolic capital helps us make sense of what's going on. So let's define that. What is symbolic capital? Well, first of all, it's symbolic because it's intangible. It's not a tangible physical currency, but it is a currency nonetheless. Why? First, we accumulate symbolic capital in the day-to-day -day decisions we make every day. For example, the last time you chose the organic version of something over the regular version, you acquired symbolic capital. The last time you chose a product because it had less single-use plastics, you acquired symbolic capital. So first and foremost, we acquire capital in the everyday decisions we make. Second, we actually trade capital with other people around us. And we trade capital because over time, we all want to amass symbolic wealth. More on that later. Symbolic capital is so critical because it helps us make sense of why there's so much change around us. Why is it that as a society, we have gone from obsessing over possessions to now suddenly being more than comfortable renting things as and when needed. Why is it that we are devaluing gradually, of course, devaluing the traditional university degree and now suddenly valuing knowledge and education on the go? Why is it that we are now, instead of spending hundreds of thousands on renovating our homes and our entire life savings, we're actually taking time to take six month long sabbaticals with our children to travel the world? Well, it's because those traditional markers of status are being usurped. They're being outshined by these emerging hundreds of thousands of new forms of symbolic capital, which are, by the way, just as difficult to acquire, but they're changing our landscape forever. So let's put that in a business context, shall we? And I'm gonna use the example of the food industry. The food industry, in particular, the protein landscape in food industry has gone through a lot of transformation in the last couple of years. I'm sure most of you in this virtual room are quite aware of that. But if you were to examine the current data, the current landscape in the protein space, what you'll find is the forms of symbolic capital that you uncover will give you a very clear sense of where protein is headed. And spoiler alert, it has nothing to do with plants. So let's dive into that. If you look at the three most dominant forms of symbolic capital in protein, you'll find the first one is about inflammation. So let me explain that, unpack that a little bit. When I talk about inflammation, what we're really talking about is the consumer is starting to understand the connection between the forms of protein, the amount of protein they consume, and how that impacts inflammation in the gut. So what is the currency there? Well, the currency includes the unique knowledge that people acquire in this space, it includes the new behaviors they create in order to manage inflammation in the gut. It also includes the new hacks and rituals they develop over time. That's what I mean by the capital, the currency of inflammation. Now, the same thing applies to nutrition as well. 
Similarly, people are understanding that the nutritional DNA, the makeup of different forms of protein is different. So how do I understand that? How do I manage that so that I'm not nutritionally deficient over time? The third form of symbolic capital is pretty obvious. It's around sustainability, and that makes sense. Now, here's the interesting part. If you look at these three forms of symbolic capital and you take a step back to think about why they matter, what you'll very quickly realize, and I mentioned this or alluded to this earlier, is that people acquire these forms of symbolic capital and they trade it with one another. So for example, I might trade my capital around inflammation with you because you have capital around nutrition. And through that trade, I am gradually acquiring wealth and I'm gradually acquiring power. And that power is what it's all about ultimately. Ultimately, we're all animals in this animal kingdom trying to survive. And that's how we survive. We exert this symbolic power subconsciously and sometimes consciously over our friends or colleagues or family, whether we like it or not. Now, if I were to examine and quantify what's going on in the protein landscape, and by the way, this data comes from our AI anthropology engine, MotiveBase where we're basically using artificial intelligence and anthropology to decode the dominant forms of symbolic capital that shape a particular landscape. So there are a few things that I wanna explain here because forms of symbolic capital are not mutually exclusive. They intersect with one another, as in many of them share meanings with one another, and that's fine, but yet they compete with one another and over time certain forms of capital will end up dominating other forms of capital in this particular landscape, by the way, we know that while the sustainability capital leads the way today, as in that currency has the most power, in the next 12 to 24 months, it will no longer lead the way. In fact, nutrition, so the connection between protein and nutrition will actually lead the way, will actually acquire the most amount of symbolic power in this landscape. Think about how powerful of an insight that is if protein matters to your business, directly or indirectly. So I know what you're thinking. Great, you have defined what symbolic capital is. You've added a bit of business context, but tell me how to get at it. Well, let's do exactly that. What is symbolic capital and how do we get at it? Well, in order to understand symbolic capital, we need to understand this thing we call meanings. So I'm gonna use the protein example here to illustrate. If you wanna understand the forms of capital around protein, we need to understand the natural, organic, inadvertently created meanings that exist in culture around protein. So what is meaning? What do I mean by that? Well, it's quite simple actually. It's the words we use as human beings, as consumers, to describe and understand things. So the words we use to describe and understand the different forms of protein and what that means to us in our lives makes up the culture of meaning, the constellation of meaning around protein. Okay, now here's the interesting thing. Now I'll take a very tangible example. Let's simplify it. Let's say the protein landscape has 1,000 words that are most commonly used by all of us in order to describe and understand what protein is. Now these 1,000 words are not gonna represent distinct meanings. They're gonna represent patterns of meanings. A lot of these words, in fact, semantically speaking, linguistically speaking, are gonna be quite similar to one another. So if we were to take these 1,000 words and we were to find shared groupings, themes of meaning, what we will in essence arrive at are the dominant forms of symbolic capital around protein. So symbolic capital is basically nothing but a theme of meaning that exists around a topic that matters to your business. So one of the most effective ways to measure symbolic capital is to use the internet. Because guess what? We now have access to millions and millions of consumers that are sharing, bearing their souls online every single day about anything and everything that matters to them. Now here's why that's important. Because we don't have to interrupt these people. We don't have to ask people questions, force them to come into you know, forums or communities to try and engage with us. People are engaging out of their own volition. They're engaging on things because they're curious about them, they're trying to figure out whether it matters to them in their lives. And the benefit of the internet is it gives us access to this unadulterated content, but most importantly, most importantly, 
it gives us the ability to access the inadvertently, naturally, organically created sets of meanings that revolve around the topics that matter to our business. Like in the protein example earlier, it helps us identify the organic meanings, the organic words that are used naturally by consumers when they discuss proteins, try to understand it, make sense of it, and describe it. That's the power of the internet. Now, add to that the fact that we now also have machine learning and artificial intelligence and all these other tools in our pockets, we have the ability to actually take away a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the legwork that traditionally as social scientists, I certainly hated to do, that now machines can do. So for example, the machine can not only scrape this information and figure out the 1,000 words that revolve around protein, but the machine can also organize words that share meanings and develop clusters or themes of meaning. So basically, the machine's doing 80% of the work, and as a social scientist, I can do the last 20% to interpret and extrapolate the symbolic capital from a particular theme of meaning. This is why this is so powerful and so exciting. It's agile, it's quick, it allows us to for once be more than just responsive. It allows us to be proactive at understanding culture in ways that we just couldn't in the past. So let me give you another example, and this time I'm gonna take personal care. Personal care is a really interesting space. Again, we used our technology to figure out what the dominant forms of symbolic capital are today that govern the future state of personal care. The first form of symbolic capital revolves around this idea of natural ingredients. So what is natural ingredients? Well, natural refers to the presence of certain ingredients like natural oils and the absence of certain ingredients like preservatives. And again, just like in the earlier example, people are accumulating new knowledge about how to pick a natural personal care product. People are figuring out hacks and new ways to behave in order to acquire these products and all of this makes up their currency around personal care and specifically around this idea of natural. The second form of capital revolves around this notion of plastic packaging and specifically around reducing single-use plastics. Again, there's currency around figuring out how I as a consumer need to change my behavior, what new knowledge I need to acquire, what new hacks I need to develop in order to figure out how I can incorporate this into my life. Now, here's the interesting part. Just like I explained earlier, these two forms of capital, they intersect with one another. They share meanings with one another. Obviously, I, you're probably thinking that there are products that are natural and don't use single-use plastics. Of course, they share meanings together, but yet they compete with one another. They compete with one another for symbolic power. Now, unlike the protein landscape, in the landscape of personal care, the thing that occupies more power today will remain the thing that occupies more power tomorrow. So the currency of plastic packaging leads the way and it will continue to lead the way. One of the byproducts, one of the side effects of living with a social scientist for my partner is that I'm constantly doing little, I call them thought experiments, my partner calls it psychological experiments. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. But a couple of weeks ago, I walked in the door and I told my partner that you know, from now on, I'm gonna be using bar soaps with paper packaging because it's better for the environment and I wanna be better as a consumer. She scoffed at me first and laughed at me and that was the end of it. But lo and behold, two weeks go by, I see her walk in the door with a new bar of soap, which has no packaging, by the way. She bought it from a health food store, and now this replaces the plastic pump hand soap in our bathroom. How amazing is that? Symbolic capital is powerful. That's why we call it symbolic power. It's powerful even at home. Let's talk about the third and last example, and this is in the grocery retail space. This is a really cool example, too, because, again, in the grocery retail space, if you examine the forms of capital that really exist today, there are actually three major forms. The first is about fresh food, but it's not about the type of fresh food you're thinking. It's not fresh fruits and veg. This is about being able to buy freshly prepared foods and meal kits. That's what this is really about. The second form of capital is about just healthier shopping habits. 
And the third is about reducing plastic waste. Again, this is about basically minimizing single-use plastics. Here's the interesting part. In today's landscape, if you were to bump into a friend of yours tomorrow at the grocery store, the best way to exert symbolic power over them is to have a grocery cart full of better for me, healthier choices. But just 12 months from now, if you bump into the same friend, the best way to exert symbolic power would be to have a grocery cart full of products that use minimal packaging, and in particular, do not use any single-use plastic packaging. That's what we're able to see, that the currency that's leading today, that occupies the most amount of power today, will no longer occupy the most amount of power tomorrow. That's incredible insight. In the grocery retail landscape, we can see how important plastics and plastic waste is going to be to shaping its future. As I mentioned earlier to you, none of these forms of symbolic capital are distinct. None of them are mutually exclusive, right? They intersect with one another. They share meanings with one another, yet they compete with one another. So, I want to next transition to talk a little bit about how exactly we can measure what comes next. Now that we have defined what symbolic capital is, we've understood how it's a currency, how it's traded, how it's acquired. We've talked about how symbolic capital comes from understanding the constellation of meaning that exists around topics and trends and ideas that we care about. We've also talked about how we can capture these symbolic meanings. Next, I want to talk about how we can measure them, and in particular, measure their change over time, because that's the holy grail, isn't it? Now, the cool thing, again, is that we're in an environment where, thanks to big data and artificial intelligence, we can use a lot of the modern techniques and tools available to us to run these predictive models, and we can do them with incredible accuracy. Why? Because we're not worrying about what's going on in the marketplace. We're worrying about what's going on in people's heads. We're worrying about what forms of capital are developing and what forms of capital will lead the way tomorrow. So let me explain how we can do this type of modeling with a simplified visual. And by the way, I'm going back to the grocery retail example before. What you're seeing on your screen is the constellation of meaning that revolves around the issue of plastic waste in the context of grocery retail. So we're looking at the symbolic capital around plastic waste. We're looking at the meanings around it. And we can see that there are some dominant themes of meaning that currently revolve around plastic waste. Now, pay attention to the screen, because what's going to happen when I change the slide here is that you're going to see new secondary and tertiary connections enter into our little constellation, into our little system. It's sort of like saying, and I apologize to the physics buffs out there, it's sort of like saying if this was you know, our solar system and plastic waste was our sun, we have just added some new planets to the equation. So how do we know when a system is growing? We know a system is growing when new meanings, in particular, new secondary and tertiary meanings attach themselves. They emerge and they attach themselves to the original system. So in the case of plastic waste, we can see that there are two new systems of meaning that have attached themselves and it has grown the overall size of the system. So new meanings around the packaging used in organic foods or new meanings around food waste, even though they're indirectly related to plastic waste, have attached themselves and as a result, the system has grown. This model, I know I'm using a simplified example, but it's so powerful because if you can model this over time and you can see the rate of change as well as the volume of change, then you can compare that to everything else and you can figure out something like what you're seeing on your screen. And that visual, by the way, comes from our technology, Motive Base, where I'm comparing what's going on today with the symbolic capital of plastic waste and what's going to happen tomorrow. And I'm, I'm comparing that with what's going on with the symbolic capital around healthier choices. So as you can see, the symbolic capital around plastic waste is going to overtake, is going to be more powerful than the symbolic capital 
around healthier habits just in the next 12 to 24 months. That's incredibly powerful to understand. Look, here's the best part about waking up each morning and remembering that I'm an anthropologist. And I run a company full of anthropologists. And our job every day is to report on culture and cultural shifts. And I'm going to leave you with a little bit of optimism in what might otherwise feel like a pretty dark and grim time. Because when you look at the trends of change, culture is actually moving in a positive direction. And we get to report on that. And we get to report on that in order to, of course, identify opportunities for the organizations we work with. But because culture is naturally moving in a positive direction, the natural byproduct of the work we do, of the opportunities we help organizations find, is social change and positive social change. That's the best part about this job. And that's the best part about studying symbolic capital. And I'll give you a few examples. The consumer is clearly telling us, for example, in women's apparel, that size inclusivity and size inclusive design are really critical to shaping its future. So if you're a brand that understands that, not only do you make money, but you also drive social change. We're learning, for example, that consumers increasingly are terrified about how much they contribute to landfill. So if you understand that, you might take a brand of yours that has never cared about this and for the first time introduce packaging that is better for the environment. You might realize that senior citizens are concerned and usually feel left out, especially when it comes to their relationship with banks. And as a bank, you could take that and give them solutions that ease their pain, especially in the midst of the pandemic as they're realizing that for the first time they have to interact with a mobile device in order to transact. And they're terrified of losing money or of fraud and so on. These are all simple examples of shifts in culture that's coming from the consumer. We're not creating these things. The consumer is telling us all we're doing is reporting on that. And the natural byproduct is social good, is social change. And that's empowering and incredibly powerful. Look, symbolic capital, and we've talked a lot about this today. Yes, it shapes the future of business, but it's shaping the future of culture, right? And I want to give you a simple example to just illustrate that further and really bring this home. If you rewind about 100 years, if my memory serves me right, and you think about one of the early thinkers in the social sciences space, Max Weber, Weber traveled from Europe to the US, and he was studying American culture. And he found that in the US, because there's an absence of a fixed status, he found that consumers, people, citizens, are living in this constant state of an identity crisis. This was 100 years ago. I think it's incredible because he basically predicted our modern world today. Because that's how we are currently living. And I've shown you numerous proof points of that. We are in a state of constant identity crisis. Why? Because the forms of symbolic capital we acquire today to you know, strengthen our wallets, to gain symbolic power, may not give us the same amount of power just two years hence. We have to constantly be evolving as consumers. That means as a brand, as a company, as a product, we have to stay one step ahead. As organizations, if we don't understand the emerging forms of capital that are shaping the future of our industries, we're going to be left out. We're constantly going to be in reactionary mode. And we're never going to have the opportunity to shape the future of the categories and the industries we live in and breathe in. And that's the power of symbolic capital. And I think that's why it will shape the future of business. Thank you.